All right, so in this lecture, I'm going to build on what we have just learned about the Bernoulli random variable. And I'm going to show you a closely related example of another discrete random variable called the binomial. Okay. So consider the situation that we toss a coin 10 times. And as I showed you, we can just simulate the situation now. We don't actually have to toss the coin ourselves. Right. So when you toss a coin 10 times, and I showed an example last time about this too, this feels very much like a Bernoulli random variable. Right. And indeed, when you toss the coin only once, that is actually a Bernoulli, Bernoulli random variable where n is equal to 1. Right. But if n is larger than 1, in this case we toss uh, the coin 10 times, so n is 10 now, we have a closely related random variable called the binomial. Right. So what does this binomial random variable look like, right? As I told you last time, a random variable has a PMF, a discrete random variable has a PMF associated, associated with it, and a CDF associated with it, right? So in the Bernoulli case, we had this random variable that I've got, I'm showing you here with 0 and 1 in the support of x, right? Now, if I toss a coin 10 times and I get the binomial random variable, the probability mass function associated with this particular random variable, the binomial, has an extra term here is n choose x, right? Instead of just this part here, it also has this additional part here because you're doing this more than once now, right? And now the support of x is not just 0 and 1. There are 11 possible outcomes now. n is equal to 10, and so I've written this in the most general way possible. I've got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That's 11 possibilities, right? That means if I toss the coin 10 times, I could get eight, uh, 10 uh, tails, one after another, not a single head. It could theoretically happen, right? Or I could get only one head, but I could get the heads in one of 11 possible locations, right? If I have 11, uh, sorry, uh, uh, 10 locations. So if I have 10 tosses, I could get a heads in any one of those locations if I get one heads, right? That's why we have this n choose uh, x term here in this, in this probability mass function. So the support of uh, x has changed, right, in this binomial compared to the, to the um, uh, Bernoulli, right? And as I mentioned, n is the number of times the, co toin, uh, the coin will be tossed, and n choose x is the number of ways you can get a particular outcome. Like one heads could, uh, in 10 coin tosses, 10 choose 1 would give you those number of possible ways you could get a heads, right, and so on. And theta is, as usual, the probability of getting a heads. This is something we are going to decide on initially when we uh, talk about uh, this random variable, and when you're simulating data, we would have to decide on theta to simulate some data. But later on, of course, we'll look at much more complex situations where we don't know what theta is. We have to estimate it somehow, given some given some data that we uh, get from an experiment or something, right? Okay, so here's a visual that should help you understand what the probability mass function amounts to graphically. This is a general advice I have for you when studying statistics. Always try to develop graphical intuitions for what we are talking about. The mathematical form is very abstract. It's hard to get a handle on. It's easier if you actually draw the picture, right? You, you've, got a, you've got a concrete figure in your mind when you're thinking about a particular distribution, right? So in this case, when theta is set to 5, the probability of success is set to 5, we have 11 possible outcomes in this example I'm giving you. And what you're looking at is the probability of each outcome. That's on the y-axis here. So the height of these bars is telling you the probability of each possible outcome, right? Okay. If I had set theta to some other number, let's say 0.1, then this probability mass function changes dramatically in shape, right? So you can see that the highest probability is of a 1 now. And then the, the distribution also gets heavily skewed to the left. If I change theta to 0 0.9, then see what happens. What happens is that the distribution shifts to the right, and it then becomes very uh, the highest probabilities at the number 9. So 9 heads out of 10 would be the highest now, right? OK. So these are the, these are, uh, you can of course vary theta to other values and you would get different shapes, right? So this is the symmetric case and then there's, these are the two asymmetric cases, the edge cases I wanted to show you, right? So this should give you an intuition for what it means to, uh, to define a probability mass function given some particular theta probability of success, okay? 
Now, just like in the Bernoulli distribution, there is this family of functions that you can use for generating random data for and for doing all the other calculations that I showed you earlier, right? So these are built-in functions. So first of all, how do I generate random data? There's a function in R called R binome, right? Which takes as input the uh, number of times you're going to toss the coin and how many experiments you're going to do and the probability of success. This is, these are the parameters you have to plug in. And what you get as output is the number of, you know, a bunch of zeros and ones. And if you sum up these, you will know what the number of heads is in this particular experiment. So it's one, two, three, four, if I count it correctly, okay? So if I ran this code again, I'd get different numbers, obviously, right? So this is just random generation of data. It's a very useful way to get a feel for what's going to happen if you repeatedly run an experiment, okay? Under some uh, parameters such as probability of success being 0.5. Right. You can play with this, right? You can change this probability and then look to see what happens here. If you change this to 0.1, you'll get mostly zeros, right? If you change this to 0.9, you'll get mostly ones, right? So you can play with that a little bit. So what I'm showing you here now is the probability of each of these possible outcomes. So the possible outcomes are these x's, 0, 1 through 10. So there are 11 outcomes here, okay? And so what you see here with this function, which we've seen before in the Bernoulli case, right? Remember in the Bernoulli, I could use the dban function to compute the probability of a tails or a heads. This time we have 11 possible outcomes. So the support of x is much broader, much larger. And so I'm gonna compute the probability of each possible outcome by using the dbinome function. So it's just the same as the dBernoulli function, dBan function, but for the binomial, right? So, and what I have to specify in this function is which event am I talking about? What uh, is the size of the experiment? So how many, what is the sample size, right? So we ran 10 uh, coin to we did 10 coin tosses here, and the probability of success I just decided on as an example at 0.5. Okay. And so what I did here is something, uh, I did a little trick here. I just created a sequence of 11 numbers ranging from 0 to 10. That's this vector here, right? And I just computed in one single shot. I computed the probabilities of every possible outcome in this particular experiment, and I saved that as a vector probs, and I just uh, created a data frame and printed it out you know, uh, in a formatted way to show you what the probabilities are of each of these possible outcomes. Right? I could have plugged in just a zero here, or a, z a one here, or a two here, and if I did that, I would get the probabilities of each of these individual numbers here. Right? And so you can see that I have uh, the different probabilities here. This is the probability mass function written out as a table. Right? I showed you exactly this probability mass function a few minutes ago, that symmetric distribution centered on, point five, on 5, right? That, that, that we saw earlier. This is exactly the same distribution that I showed you, except it's now as a table, right? So that's the probability mass function using the d binome function, right? And you can also now compute the cumulative distribution function Right? You, and there's a built-in function in R, just like in the case of the Bernoulli, we had the p-ban function there. Now we have the p-binome function, which allows us to compute, what does it allow us to compute? It allows us to compute the cumulative probabilities of every possible outcome in the support of x, the probability of zero or less than zero, one or less than one, two or less than two, Right, so that's what I'm doing here. I just, again, I did this in one shot. I just created a vector zero to 10, right? This is the vector zero to 10, and I'm showing you the cumulative probability, right, function here. This is the actual CDF. This is literally the CDF that I'm showing you. As input, it takes a number between zero and 10, and as output, it gives you the cumulative probability of observing that number or something less than that. And so what you should notice is that when I ask What's the probability of observing 10 or something less than that? That probability has to be 1. Why? Because that subsumes 10 or less than 10, subsumes all possible outcomes, right? So that probability will have to, have to be 1. And indeed, it is 1. If you look here, it is 1, right? So a cumulative distribution function has this property that is always going to go up, 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 unto, up to 1. Why 1? Because that's the total probability that you can have of all possible events, right? 
This is a characteristic property of CDFs. And I want you to remember that the CDF is actually created from the probability mass function. We used it by summing up the numbers from the probability mass function. Okay, okay so <clears throat> here's a new function that I have not introduced yet that is also available in R. This is called the inverse, inverse of the cumulative distribution function. Okay, so what this, what the question that this function answers is, what is the quantile? So what is the particular element in the support of x such that the probability of observing that particular number q or something less than that is the probability p? So you provide the probability, and the function, the inverse of the CDF, will give you the quantile that corresponds to that cumulative probability. Okay, so how does that work? So let me show you how this works. This is the function p binom. Uh, sorry, this, this function, the p binom function, is going to take as input the 11 possible outcomes and give me the probability of each of those possible outcomes. Not just the probability, the cumulative probability, right? Zero or less than zero, one or less than one, and so on, right? These are the cumulative probabilities I just drew earlier. This is, this is the same vector of uh, probabilities, these ones here, that I'm talking about here, right? So what I'm going to do some now is something really weird. I'm going to take each of these 11 probabilities and plug, the, plug them into a new function that you've never seen before. This function is, a, is called the Q binome function. And if for every distribution, there will be this Q function available, as I will show you later. So. What I'm doing here with this Q binome function is that I'm plugging in the cumulative probabilities of 0 to 10 uh, outcomes or less, right? And what I'm getting back from this function is the actual quantiles. That means the numbers 0 to 10. So that's what this inverse of the CDF looks like. It takes as input a probability, and it returns one of the 10 possible, 11 possible outcomes. Right? So it's literally doing the opposite of the CDF. Right? So if you see here, the CDF takes as input a number between 0 and 10, a discrete number, of course, and it returns a probability. If I flip the axes of this distribution, I get the inverse of the CDF. Right? And that's what this Q binom function is doing. It takes as input a number between 0 and 10, a discrete number, of course, and it returns the probability. Um, uh, sorry. I got that wrong. It takes as input the probability that would give you that particular number, right, between 0 and 10, and it returns that number that corresponds to that cumulative probability, right? That's why it's called the inverse of the CDF. So what we have now is we, we've got the R binome function, the, which gives us random data. We've got the P binome function, which gives us the cumulative distribution function. We've got the D binome function, which gives us the actual probability mass function, right? And finally, this new function that I've shown you, the Q binome function. So together, these functions are called the DPQR family of functions. And they will be available. This is the cool thing. They're available for every distribution that is used in, uh, in statistical modeling. Okay? Right. So this just summarizes what I just told you. So what we're going to do next is that we're going to look at an example of a continuous random variable. Until now, we've just looked at two examples of discrete random variables, the Bernoulli and the binomial. Now we are going to look at a more complex situation where the support of x is actually continuous values in the real number line. Right? There are no discrete values anymore. Between 0 and 1 and 1 and 2, there can be an infinity of possible values. Right? So that's called a continuous random variable. And I will discuss a canonical example of a, of a continuous random variable, the normal random variable, so using the normal distribution. So that's coming up next.